Hello everyone, this is Dr. Tamar al -Subai. I'm a rheumatologist at CHI, Little Rock Diagnostic Clinic in Little Rock. And today my topic is about Sjogren's Syndrome. The reason I chose this topic because Sjogren's Syndrome is a common disease and it's uh, frequently underdiagnosed. Uh, in my lecture I'm going to talk about the epidemiology pathogenesis, diagnosis, management, and I'll give two example cases. Sjogren's syndrome, it's a chronic, slowly progressive autoimmune disease of unknown etiology. It's either primary or secondary. The primary Sjogren's syndrome, which happens without other autoimmune conditions, affects 0.1 to 4% of the population based on the criteria used. It mainly affects the exocrine glands, uh, which result in dryness in the mucosal surfaces of the mouth, eyes, nose, pharynx, larynx, and GI tracts, as well as skin. When it affects the mouth, we call that xeropstomia. When it affects the eyes, it it's called xeropthalmia or keratoconjunctivitis sicca. It's more prevalent in women, nine women to one man, and it's more common in 30 to 50 years of age. It's also more common in white population. As I mentioned in the previous slide, Sjogren's syndrome can be either primary or secondary. Primary Sjogren's syndrome occurs in isolation, without other rheumatic diseases. It's uh, usually associated with HLA, DR B1 and DR B1 genotype. It's more commonly associated with SSA and SSB antibodies, and it's associated with extra glandular features, including parotid gland enlargement, lymphadenopathy, and lymphoma, whereas the secondary Sjogren's syndrome can occur in the setting of other rheumatic diseases, especially rheumatoid arthritis. It's estimated about 15 to 20% of rheumatoid arthritis patients have Sjogren's syndrome. It also be seen in other conditions like uh, lupus. Uh, it's associated with positive HLA-DR. The clinical features of primary and secondary Sjogren's, especially when it uh, comes to dryness, uh, are similar. The manifestations of Sjogren's syndrome results from lymphocytic infiltration of glandular and non-glandular organs. Over 90% of the infiltrating cells are either CD4 T lymphocytes with memory phenotypes or B lymphocytes. The remaining 10% include other cells. These cells include plasma cells, CD8 lymphocytes, T regulatory cells, natural killer cells, or dendritic cells. The most common presentation for Sjogren's syndrome is Sika, which consists of keratoconjunctivitis Sika or xeropthalmia, which results from deficient aqueous layer of uh, tear film, which normally compromises 90% of the tear volume, and present as gritty eyes or foreign body sensation in the eyes, pain in the eyes, burning, itchy, red eyes, and that can lead to corneal erosions, blurry vision, photophobia, and visual loss. The other presentation is dry mouth or xeroptomia, which can cause caries and difficulty eating dry food. It can also cause change in taste, difficulty swallowing, loose fillings, cracked teeth, and predisposition to candida. Uh, it also causes problem with uh, wearing dentures, 
many of Sjogren's syndrome patients end up with having dentures at early age. In this picture, we see a patient with Sjogren's syndrome who has uh, severe dryness, which can cause uh, a deep uh, red tongue and fissures in the tongue. Normally, we produce uh, 1 liter to 1.5 liter of saliva a day. However, in Sjogren's patients, uh, that decreases to less than 50%. Sjogren's syndrome can cause dryness in the upper airways, which can be manifested as non-allergic rhinitis, sinusitis, and bleeding. It can cause dryness in the larynx, which causes hoarseness, dryness in the trachea, which causes dry cough, vaginal dryness, which can cause dyspareunia, uh, GI tract dryness, which can cause dysphagia and constipation. It also affects the skin, which can cause itching. It also presents as symmetric parotid lacrimal swelling, which is common. Now I'm going to talk about the extraglandular manifestations, which include arthralgias and arthritis, uh, which resemble rheumatoid arthritis without erosions, and that's what we call Jacquard's arthropathy, which also can be seen in patients with lupus. About 8 to 10 percent of Sjogren's patients have positive CCP antibody, uh, but these patients end up having rheumatoid arthritis. Patients with Sjogren also can have uh, myalgia, which is common. Fatigue is extremely common. Myositis is rare. Uh, it can affect the respiratory system. About 25% of patients with Sjogren's have abnormal PFT, uh, but most of it is not clinically significant. We should consider Sjogren's syndrome in any patient with unexplained lung disease and positive ANA. Patients also can have renal tubular acidosis, which can lead to severe potassium wasting and muscle paralysis. And it can also lead to uh, nephrocalcinosis and nephrolithiasis. Sjogren's syndrome can also cause interstitial nephritis. It rarely causes glomerulonephritis uh, and nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. When it comes to the GI manifestations, difficulty swallowing is common, constipation is common. Patients with Sjogren have high prevalence of celiac disease. They also can have a subclinical hyperemilesia and transaminitis, usually in the setting of hepatitis C infection. Vasculitis can happen, but usually it's cutaneous vasculitis and benign, and most of the time doesn't need treatment. Systemic vasculitis is rare. Other extraglandular manifestations include the nervous system. Patient can have cranial nor nerve involvement uh, or can present like uh, multiple sclerosis uh, with imaging of the brain. They can also have seizures, transverse myelitis, optic neuritis. Sjogren's syndrome can affect the peripheral nervous system. Patients present with peripheral neuropathy, with either uh, motor, which present like motor neuritis multiplex, pure sensory or sensory motor presentation. It also can cause uh, small fiber neuropathy. Patients with Sjogren's syndrome have other uh, manifestations, which can include fatigue, chronic pain. They are at increased risk for uh, lymphoma, especially B-cell non-Hodgkin's lymphoma.
up to 40 folds than general population. It's very important because they like the, to mention that in the uh, board exam. Uh, Sjogren patient also can uh, have increased risk for maltoma in the setting of H. pylori infection. Uh, they are inc at increased risk for thyroid disease and many patients have anti-thyroid antibodies and altered thyroid biochemistry without uh, clinical symptoms. Uh, patients with Sjogren can have uh, interstitial cystitis which cause increased frequency, nocturia, and perennial pain. About 33% of patients with Sjogren have additional autoimmune disease. 6% have two autoimmune diseases, and 2% have three autoimmune diseases in a study which involved 114 patients of Sjogren's syndrome. Anemia is common in patients with Sjogren syndrome. Uh, leukopenia can affect 15 to 20 percent, and uh, SED rate usually raised, whereas CRP usually normal. And this slide is a summary of the extraglandular manifestations. As you see here, 70 percent of patients can have fatigue. 36% of patients can present with arthralgia and arthritis. Neurologic symptoms are fairly common and it varies between 8 to 27%. Most of it is peripheral neuropathy. Raynaud's phenomenon is fairly common. Cryoglobulinemia affects 4 to 12%, mostly in patients with hepatitis C. Thyroid conditions and uh, lab abnormality affects about 10 to 15 percent of Sjogren's patients. Skin vasculitis and the dry skin is fairly common, and interstitial lomonitis can affect 5 to 9 percent. It's listed here like systemic vasculitis affects 7 percent, but it's not usually reflected in the common practice. Now let's talk about the diagnosis. We'll start with the dry eyes. Usually occurs in the setting of patients complain of eye symptoms, especially dryness, and the other symptoms mentioned in the previous slides. Many patients who come to my clinic for Sjogren's syndrome usually come for other conditions, especially abnormal test like a positive ANA or positive SSA antibody, or they come for other symptoms like joint pain or arthritis, but when I ask them more questions about uh, dryness, they mention that they have the symptoms. Very rarely patients come to see me because of the dryness alone. To assess the dry eyes, there are three ways to do it. The first one, which can be done uh, by any physician, which called Sjogren's test, in which a strip of filter paper is placed under the lower eyelid, like we see in this picture, and wetting is measured. Uh, usually patients with Sjogren's syndrome have less than five millimeter of paper wetting in five minutes. This test is usually a screening and not diagnostic test. The other two tests, which uh, are the ocular surface staining and tear breakup time tests, are usually done by ophthalmologist. The ocular surface staining can be either using uh, fluorescent or lysamine green dye uh, to assess cornea and conjunctiva uh, respectively, whereas the tear breakup time measures the disruption in the tear film. Again, the last two tests usually done by ophthalmologists. 
in this slide uh, we'll see how to diagnose salivary gland involvement. The dry mouth is assessed by direct examination where we can see lack of saliva and dental take caries which suggests the diagnosis. There are more specific tests. We'll start with the cielometry which can be used to quantitate saliva production by measuring the unstimulated whole saliva flow. If it's less than 0.1 milliliter per minute, that will meet the diagnosis of xerostomia. This test has sensitivity of 56% and specificity of 81%. Next test is scintigraphy, which, is, which utilizes uh, the uptake and secretion of radioactive material which uh, injected through the IV and quantitate salivary flow rate. It has a sensitivity of 75% and specificity of 78%. Next test is CLO graphy which is used to outline salivary gland anatomy and uh, to measure the saliva flow. However, this test can lead to pain, infection, or duct rupture. Next uh, tests are MRI and ultrasound, which can detect the parenchymal heterogeneity. Small salivary gland biopsy is the gold standard uh, way to diagnose Sjogren's syndrome, especially if patients have negative SSA and SSB antibodies. It's done by making a small cut in the lower lip and removing at least four to six small salivary glands. It's better to be done by uh, either ENT specialist or oral surgeon to minimize the risk for nerve damage. When we get the result of the positive uh, salivary gland biopsy for Sjogren's patient, it says focus score 1, 2, 3 or more. That means that the slide shows at least 50 uh, lymphocytes in 4 millimeters square. In the biopsy shown in the slide, you see two lymphocytic foci. So in that particular patient, this patient has focus score, focus score two, since the, he has two aggregates of 50 cells. In this slide, we see some of the antibodies involved in Sjogren's syndrome. The first one is ANA, anti-nuclear antibody, which can be seen in 85 to 90% of Sjogren patient. Rheumatoid factor can be seen in 50 to 60% of patients with Sjogren's without rheumatoid arthritis. So when you have a patient who have positive rheumatoid factor without rheumatoid arthritis, ask about sicker symptoms to see if the patient has Sjogren's syndrome. SSA antibody can be seen in 50 to 70 percent. It's more common in primary Sjogren compared to secondary Sjogren. It also can be seen in systemic lupus and skin lupus. SSB antibody can be seen in 33 percent to 50 percent of Sjogren patient, usually with positive SSA antibody. If somebody has positive SSB antibody without positive SSA antibody, we have to be careful with the making the diagnosis or the association with Sjogren. Both SSA and SSB antibodies can precede the diagnosis of Sjogren syndrome by up to two decades. A panel of new antibodies including salivary protein 1 antibody, carbonic anhydrase 6 antibody, and parotid secretory protein is being marketed as SJO test.
The initial studies suggest that these antibodies may be helpful to identify seronegative patients who otherwise meet the ACR criteria for Sjogren's syndrome. Other lab abnormalities include uh, elevated sedimentation rate, which can be seen in 80 to 90 percent of patients. As I mentioned previously, C-reactive protein is usually normal. Uh, up to 80 percent of patients with Sjogren's syndrome have hypergammaglobulinemia. 10 percent can have uh, leukopenia. 25 percent anemia of chronic disease. Thrombocytopenia is rare. In this slide, we see the 2017 American College of Rheumatology and ULAR uh, classification criteria for primary Sjogren syndrome. Uh, it requires the presence of sickest symptoms plus a combination of the following, which result in a score of at least four. We can see that the small salivary gland biopsy and SSA antibodies carry the same weight of 3. Uh, we can also notice that SSB antibody is not included in this criteria. And uh, the other thing we notice that the ocular staining score, Shirmer test, and unstimulated whole saliva flow rate carry the same weight of 1. As uh, you saw on the previous slide, the 2017 criteria for Sjogren's syndrome excludes diseases and condition like prior head and neck radiation, history of uh, active hepatitis C infection, AIDS, sarcoidosis, amyloidosis, graft versus host disease, and IgG related disease. All these conditions are in the differential diagnosis of Sjogren's syndrome. Other conditions in the differential diagnosis include GPA, lymphoma, and mumps. We also need to make sure that uh, aging can cause dryness in the mouth and eyes. And also we need to pay attention to medications which can cause dryness, especially antihistamines, benzodiazepines, clonidine, diuretics, tricyclic antidepressants, and painkillers. When it comes to your board exam, uh, in HIV AIDS patients, the small salivary gland biopsy shows CD8 lymphocytes versus CD4 in Sjogren's syndrome. In IgG4 related disease, usually they show you pictures with asymmetric uh, parotid gland enlargement or lacrimal gland enlargement in the setting of either increased serum IgG4 level or a biopsy of the tissue, which uh, has IgG4. In the next few slides, we'll discuss the management of Sjogren's syndrome. Let's start with the uh, management of dry mouth. Uh, the purpose of that is to uh, preserve the moisture and relieve the symptoms. So how do we do that uh, for the dry mouth? Frequent sips of water is much better than drinking large amount of water at the same time. A good oral hygiene is essential. A high concentration fluoride toothpaste is good for patients with Sjogren's syndrome. Turmeric is shown in mouse models to reduce cellular infiltrates and I advise my patients to use it uh, patients also need to use sugar-free uh, gum and lozenges and artificial saliva or mouth lubricating sprays. There are many 
uh, over-the-counter brands uh, like uh, Biotin, uh, ACT, Xelimelt, Therabreath. The patient should avoid smoking and avoid sugar-rich uh, foods and also to avoid highly acidic uh, beverages, especially herbal teas and cola. And they should have uh, routine uh, regular appointments with their dental hygienist. When it comes to managing dry eyes or xerophthalmia, uh, we start first with uh, environment modification by using a humidifier, turning off the ceiling fans, limit time at the computer, reduce caffeine, reduce smoking or quit smoking and increase fluid intake. Next step is to use uh, over-the-counter preservative free eye drops like Sustain, Theratears and the Fresh Eyes. Some patients uh, have to use corticosteroids, eye drops. It's usually prescribed by eye doctors, mainly for moderate and severe conditions. There are two FDA approved eye drops for dry eyes, one called cyclosporine or restasis. The other one is leftigrast or xedra. It's prescribed by ophthalmologist or opterometrist. Uh, for moderate to severe disease. Autologous eye drops uh, can be prescribed for severe cases in which uh, blood is drawn from the patient and then the serum is taken to make eye drops. I have many patients who use that. It's very effective. Lubricant ointments usually used at night since it can cause blurry vision. Punctual uh, occlusion uh, performed by ophthalmologist and it can delay tear clearance by putting temporary plugs followed by permanent plugs. Scleral contact lenses with moisture reservoir can be prescribed by ophthalmologist. We need to recognize and treat blepharitis if present. With regards to extraglandular manifestation management, uh, let's start with the arthritis. Uh, we always start with the NSAIDs, and if that fails, you can use hydroxychloroquine, methotrexate, or leflunamide, in addition to low dose prednisone. For CNS manifestations, or pulmonary manifestations, especially in the severe cases, as well as severe kidney involvement or systemic vasculitis. We can use high-dose steroids, azathioprine, mycophenolate, mofetil, and cyclophosphamide, as well as rituximab. It's very important to manage fibromyalgia since it's very common in Sjogren's patients. The prognosis of Sjogren's syndrome is favorable with no overall increase in mortality. Rarely patients can have end organ involvement, which can be life-threatening. It's essential to manage sicker symptoms to reduce the risk of corneal damage and visual loss and loss of teeth. Patients with Sjogren's syndrome are at increased risk for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, especially primary Sjogren's patient, but also it can be seen in secondary Sjogren cases. Pregnant women who have positive SSA or SSB antibody have increased risk for neonatal lupus or fetal congenital heart block. Yeah, this question can be seen in your board exam.
Now let's go to the cases. The first one is 66 year old woman who is evaluated after developing five den dental caries over the past year. She cannot eat crackers without accompanying water. She has lost two teeth due to caries. She also reports scratchy and itchy eyes for two years and intermittent joint pain, particularly of the small hand joints for one year. She takes ibuprofen as needed for joint pain with relief. On physical examination, it's significant for poor salivary pooling and enlargement in the parotid and lacrimal glands, as well as tenderness without swelling in the second through fourth MTP joints bilaterally. Lab tests showed positive rheumatoid factor, highly positive ANA, and SSA antibody. Shiremer test was diminished at 3 millimeter. Normal is more than 5 millimeter. Chest x-ray was normal. Hand x-ray showed no erosions. What is the most appropriate treatment for this patient at this time? Is it artificial tears and sugar-free candies, methotrexate, pilocarbine, rituximab, or topical ophthalmic NSAID drops? Why it's not methotrexate? Because the patient's uh, joint symptoms are well controlled by NSAIDs. Pilocarbine is a good option for dry mouth, but it doesn't help dry eyes. This can be used after trying sugar-free candies. Rituximab only used for systemic chagrin disease complications or severe disease, which this patient doesn't have. Topical ophthalmic NSAIDs are not used in dry eyes because it can carry increased risk for severe corneal disease so the right answer is A, artificial tears and sugar-free candies. By the way, this question and the next question are from MKSAB18. Next case is the 32-year-old woman who is evaluated for two-year history of dry mouth and dry eyes. Her dry eyes was... Uh, confirmed by uh, ophthalmologist on her exam she has poor salivary pooling in addition to bilateral parotid and lacrimal gland involvement the rest of the exam is normal her lab test as well as chest x-ray were normal What is the most appropriate diagnostic test to be performed next? Is it CT scan of the chest, lip biopsy, parotid biopsy, Shiremer test, or cyalography? The correct answer is lip biopsy, which is the gold standard measure to diagnose Sjogren syndrome in the absence of positive antibodies. The other test can be helpful, but not diagnostic. The CT scan of the chest can be used mainly to evaluate lung disease or to evaluate sarcoidosis or lymphoma. In summary, Sjogren's syndrome is a chronic Autoimmune disease affect salivary gland and lacrimal glands with the most common presentation being sicker symptoms. Patients with Sjogren syndrome are at increased risk for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. The diagnosis of Sjogren syndrome is typically triggered by complaint of sicker symptoms and requires objective confirmation of exocrine gland involvement
along with demonstration of autoimmunity. In patients with Sjogren's syndrome, management of Sika is centered on preservation of moisture and relief of symptoms. Extra glandular involvement is treated with immunosuppression as well as DMARDs and steroids. Uh, in the end, I'd like to uh, thank Dr. Justin Casper, who put the first uh, slides. Uh, I also would like to thank my son, Safi, who helped me with the uh, PowerPoint presentation and audio. I wish all of you good luck in your boards. Please feel free if you have any rheumatology questions.